Yo, 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 yo. not change the world. I only have 18 minutes so I have to be very brief. I have to be very brief and to the point. To the point. I would like to tell you how I went to Cuba and I met a group of fantastic artists. Multidisciplinary artists which believe that art is something that can change society. It's not simply a commodity to be sold and peddled in boxes or by bringing people into your boxes. I went, I met them and I went on one of their healing sessions where they proved that music it can heal people, it can transform people, it can make them better people and also improve the communities around them. I'd love to tell you how I got back to Lithuania and I found it difficult to play for money after I saw that. I'd love to tell you the story of how I told my band in Kulto, hey guys, this is cool shit, we should try this out. And after a lot of effort, how I convinced them to go out to the streets and play. I'd love to tell you how that took us to Eurovision. I'd love to tell you how we had a beautiful experience afterwards, where we went around Lithuania playing in places where you wouldn't play usually. Just playing for, you know, social capital, for smiles, for something which is really worth something, but you can't quantify in terms of money. I'd love also to tell you how, I'd love to tell you how our band broke up because of this. Because, you know, some people said, so where's the business case? Why are we doing this? But I don't have time to talk to you about that. I'd love to tell you how I went to business school and how I really got into corporate social responsibility and I found lots of interesting literature and people saying that it's a great opportunity, that it's something that uh, does not necessarily have to be something to that, that companies have to engage to in order to, uh, to clean their, their keep it asajinia, their, their conscious, it's something that can actually be a tool for innovation. I'd love to talk to you about this thing because I wrote a master's degree thesis on it and it was very good. But I can't talk to you about it. I'll start from here and I'd like to talk to you about why I do music and how I measure value. It, when I was about 14 years old, I took a, an encyclopedia and I looked up the, the, the definition of life. And I thought it was very interesting because, I mean, you didn't have Wikipedia back then or anything like that. So we took the, the old school encyclopedia. And one of the very interesting things I found in the encyclopedia is that life is very much interwound with the ability to react to stimuli. Ha! Huh! Thank you. And also to the ability to react to stimuli. So I thought that was very interesting. And I, I began to actually define a lot of things in my life in function of stimulus. And I even thought, you know what? Maybe then the goodness of life is defined on by the quality of the stimulus I not only give, but also the quality of the stimulus I get. 
And that to me sounds very interesting. A lot of people will say working for stimulus is nonsense. It's absolute rubbish. How can you quantify stimulus? For me, it makes more sense than to live your life in function of the money you earn and spend, which is what many of you do or will do very soon. Let's put the music back on. Okay. Who's this guy? Who's this guy? Very good. This guy is Oscar Wilde, and he has this quote. You got it? You got it? I think this is really interesting, because according to this, we have an epidemic of cynicism in the world. We have people who have started to value things in monetary terms way too often, and even when it's not due. And I'm not the only one who's talking about this. There's this guy, a very interesting author called Michael J. Sandel, who writes about the monetization of society and of social relationships. According to this guy, what's happening is very sad because what's happening is that we're moving towards the market society where everything we do is valued in money. Oh, that decision will cost you this and that much. But this is absolute rubbish and it's actually a very big problem because what worries me is like, imagine, okay, I give a good show today, right? Don't. A girl comes up to me and says, Jurgis, you played so nicely. Let me give you a kiss, I say, okay? And she gives me a kiss. Ah. And someone comes up to say, was that a nice kiss? I says, wonderful kiss. What's it worth? $50, $100. Just the point of putting a price on it degrades it. It's like saying, you know what? My relationship with my kids is worth a million dollars. What are you talking about? Yeah, you know the biosphere and the Amazon, it's worth 10 quadrillion dollars. What the fuck are you talking about? It doesn't make sense. Because the thing is that you cannot take and easily convert these, these measures of value. It cannot be done. And you can think I'm crazy. This is another thing that uh, Mr. Sandel wrote. Lots of wisdom there. But then I encountered a very interesting concept when I was studying, uh, doing uh, my thesis. And it's this, this concept, antinomy. It means when two things are, are independently, uh, or independently make sense, but when you put them together, they conflict amongst each other. Nesuderinamumas. Right? And this is the problem we have in business, that people say, okay, I want to do social responsibility. I want to do social responsibility. Where's the bottom line? Okay, so you know, people in my company will feel better about themselves. Show me how this will appear on my balance sheet. But does that mean that that value has not been created? That it's not worth anything? Okay, I'm going to ignore the music because I have very little time. If you come to my long presentation, there'll be lots of music. This is? Adam Smith, yes. This is Adam Smith. And we know Adam Smith is a person who always talks about the free market, laissez-faire, right, 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 right. This is something said by Adam Smith. Because we have, we have, did you read it? Got it? Got it? Okay. Uh, we have forgotten actually the historical context of business. Business was actually, oh shit. Business is actually very, uh, it's very important, but business is a privilege. It's not only something that you can do to seek your own self-realization for money. It is also a responsibility, it's a promise. It's a promise to be the best way of distributing wealth in our society effectively. Effectively. To meet all our needs, right? Does this make sense to you? Ladies and gentlemen, does this make sense to you? Thank you, very good, all right. This is Eddie Bernays. Eddie Bernays is the person responsible for moving our economy from a needs-based economy to a desires-based economy. He's the master of propaganda. He's the guy who got women smoking. He's the nephew of this man. This man is Sigmund Freud, yes. Eddie Bernays very successfully took the ideas of Sigmund Freud, which involve your reptilian brain, your subconscious desires, and turned them into desires that fuel our economy. Because what happened was after the Second World War, people were building things and destroying th stuff. Building and destroying, lots of production. Looks very good on the economy, you know, like BVP, Ooh, very good. So what then? What then when we're not building and destroying stuff? Some people on Wall Street said that what we need to do is to move from this needs-based economy where I buy two pairs of shoes a year to a desires-based economy where I have 16 pairs of shoes and I buy things before they have finished their uh, lifetime. Clear? Clear, okay, cool, let's move on. This leads me to a very bad, to, to a problem which I think is very, it's very relevant for us. It's the rational market's unreasonable desire paradox. 
Remember how I said that uh, business is a promise? It's the best way to make the most of our resources, right? Right? Okay. It's the best way to satisfy our needs. What about our desires? What if I want a gold toilet? What if I want my phone with Swarovski crystals? What about that? I don't think that capitalism, the way Adam Smith imagined it, is ready for our desires. And I think that if you look around, or even if you turn on the news for a minute, you see actually the grave impact that this culture of desires is having on our resources. This is Stanley Milgram. He performed a very interesting experiment where he took a whole lot of people and he said, okay, I'm going to give you this. No, I'm not going to give you that, but he gave you that. And he said, you have to ask him questions. If he answers the questions wrong, you have to give him an electroshock. Clear? Clear. Wrong. Eh, wrong. Eh. And he would increase if increasingly up the dose of electricity to the point where there was skull and bones, 230 volts, danger, danger, danger. The guy over there was actually an actor. He was an actor. And he'd be going, ah, oh, ah, oh, oh. And at some point in the experiment, someone would say, <laughs> at some point in the experiment, someone would say, I have to stop. I can't continue to do this. And then a guy in a white robe would come up and say, look, the experiment requires you continue. And do you know how many people gave a fatal dose of electric shock to the poor guy? Or would have given it? 65%. Two-thirds. Two-thirds. And this takes me here. This is what I call the personal conviction by bypass. Because what Stanley Milgram found is that if you are with an, an authority figure next to you, and you can pass on the responsibility, if he is close, you will pass on the responsibility. Two out of three of you. And this experiment has been performed over and over in different places, and somehow the two-thirds figure seems to be relevant. Okay, so when you've got the personal conviction bypass, right, and you add that to the rational markets and unreasonable desires paradox, remember? You remember this? Remember? Okay, you get this problem. Loop of mutual irresponsibility, or what I call trip to grandma's. Okay, loop of mutual irresponsibility. Imagine this. You have business. Business says, it is my mandate to satisfy your needs. Buy. Okay, this is water. What? With sugar? Okay. Taurine, some other crap in it. Okay, good. Okay, I'll buy it. Okay, perfect. The person at the other side, he sees that he's an authority figure with maybe a white robe, nice smile. Eee, bye. He doesn't question that this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Why I call it trip to grandma's is because I have this situation very often. People who have kids will know how this happens. You take your kids to grandma's, okay? And just tell your kid, okay, eh, don't watch too much TV. Don't watch too much TV. And don't eat too much chocolate, okay? Eye on you. Okay, he goes to grandma's, bah, he goes to grandma's. He comes back, you know. <laughs> you know, he, he has a, he's, he has, he's gonna have a, a, an audiovisual overdose hangover and like a problem with his, with his sugar and caffeine. And you ask him, what happened? He said, grandma said she wanted to spoil me. <laughs> he says, but I told you not to, but you know she's the authority. I said, what the hell? You call the grandparents, hey, listen, what happened here? Why'd you give him the, the, the stuff? He says, it's my duty to spoil him. <laughs> but you will find these loops everywhere where you will not know who's responsible. Hey, do you know what you're doing? No, I don't know. What, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> Let's do it anyways. Okay. <laughs> this is a very big problem. The only way around this is individual awareness. Individual. You need to be very, very stubborn. You are already in the one-third if you are going to actually look at what you want and going to do something about it. This is a mirror. And one day, don't let that something happen that you don't see anyone in this mirror. I don't know why I put that up, but it's a beautiful picture. <laughs> this man is very important to me, not because of the religious value, but because he's a campaigner. He's the best campaigner in all of history. All of history. This was a man who had his fisherman friend and he said, hey, listen, John, you know what? You need to be good to your brother like you are to you, you know? Peter, man, Peter, you know that there's a father over there and we need to be good here on earth so we can go up, you know? And he was explaining and he was on and on about it, on and on. He got 12 guys, doing and they went back and forth across Israel, on and on about the same things. And he said, hey, let's go to Jerusalem. 
Okay, Jesus is not such a good idea. Let's go to Jerusalem. Come on, man. Okay, we go to Jerusalem. Cool, Jerusalem. Okay. He's on and on, on and on about his same things, you know, his same windmills, on and on. Pontius Pilatus says, guy, I, I don't want to kill you. Are you going to keep this up? On and on and on and on and on and on. The Jews, you know, just kill him, man. We're tired of this guy. Okay, tun, ta. They kill him. That's not enough. He comes back from the grave. And he goes on and on and on and on and on and on. This is, this is a person who's popular because he's so stubborn. Because he had a point to make. And this is how stubborn you people need to be if you're actually not going to talk about changes, but going to do something about it. So what I would, I'm gonna, I was going to tell you about what I'm doing, but I won't. I'm going to skip it. I want you to fixate these things. Quality of life is not necessarily measured in what you earn and spend. Money is not a very good uh, measure of value. Our, econom our economy is definitely not economical. Don't let anybody lie to you and tell you otherwise. Your hand can be a visible hand. What I've done now is I've decided this year to play not for money. I have taken out the monetary part out of my music because I need a detox, because I want to prove a point, but I'm being very stubborn. People call me, they say, Jorgis, we want you to play. I say, okay, what can you offer me? Offer something. Uh, 5,000 liters. It's no good. And they kept thinking. This is a windmill. This is my windmill. I would suggest that you find your own windmills and be very, very, very stubborn. You know, like Protestants say, be like Jesus. Be stubborn like Jesus. Be just as stubborn. Music will not save the world, ladies and gentlemen. At the very best, it will only be a soundtrack. You have to save the world and don't just stop talking about it. Do find something very stubborn to do. Because you don't know at this point if you're crazy or the world around you is crazy. Because life is very short, I would suggest you take the risk. But on the other hand, I would also advise you to listen to this man again, Oscar Wilde. Because the second part of the quote I showed at the beginning, it actually shows the whole dimension of the problem. It reads like this. Clear? I don't like hippies who don't think about the conse consequences of their actions. If you think that you can live your life and not think how you're going to feed yourself, put clothes on your back, how you're going to feed your kids, that's very irresponsible. So what I suggest is find a balance. Find something to put bread on the table and on the side as a hobby, instead of like, you know, doing something expensive, do something which really, 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 really motivates you. Something that you really believe in. That's my presentation. Five Four, three, two, one. Thank you very much. <laughs>